Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. This is um, part two of our webinar series on overcoming the burden of delay and cost overruns concerning the psychology of claims, understanding human behavior when challenged by adversity in the delivery of engineering construction projects. Um, just by way of introduction, I'm Alex Johnson. I'm a partner with Freeths. I'm an engineering and construction lawyer. As ever, I'm joined by John Fotherby, partner at Kingsfield Academy. And um, we also have Wayne in the background, working his magic as usual and keeping the show on the road. So in the previous webinar, a couple of weeks ago, we, we considered the topic of fact, fiction and claims. And if you joined us for that one, we explored um, what claims are and you know what, what drives claims when they're made by parties. So this time around, we, we're going to explore a, um, a couple of issues which are in, interconnected and they are subject of many claims in engineering construction, but they're not always properly understood. Delay liquidated damages and the extension of time clause. We're going to consider the purpose of these clauses as well as which party benefits from them. So as usual, we've got an hour for this webinar. Um, we have a lot of content and the last thing we want to do in an extension of time webinar is overrun. So we're going to do our best to uh, get through it as, uh, as rapidly as possible. Um, but if you do have questions, please answer, ask them in the usual way. And if we have time at the end, uh, we'll address them. But otherwise, if you if you think of any questions or if you have any issues that you are facing on your projects that concern these issues, then um, if you can't submit them during the webinar, please email John and John or myself directly, and we'll be happy to answer them for you. So we'll we'll jump straight in with an example. Um, I have decided I have some space in my garden and I'd like to build a power plant. Um, I've employed John as my contractor to build the power plant for me. And so John and I have agreed a very basic written contract. And what it says is this. John agrees to engineer, procure and construct Alex's power plant in exchange for payment of 100 million pounds. Seems very reasonable. John will complete the works by the 1st of January 2022. Now, John is ready to start work today, 30th of July, 2020, and his workforce has arrived on the site. Uh, the only problem is I haven't secured access rights over the site yet, and so I can't let John's workforce in. Now, it takes a further six months to get access, so that has delayed John's progress by six months. Now, that gives rise to the question, what are the legal implications? So what we'd like to do is see what you think. This is the first poll that we'd like you to consider. What are the legal implications of what I've just said? You can use more than one of these answers. Is it John gets a six month extension of time? John is obliged to complete the works by the 1st of January 2022 as agreed. John will suffer liquidated damages or I have to pay John's prolongation costs. What do you think? I think we've got some results coming. Okay, we've got a, a pretty good split there. 51% um, for six month extension of time. 26% uh, of you think John still has to complete the work on time. 20% um, John gets hit with liquidated damages and 69% um, I have to pay prolongation costs. Thanks everyone for that. Um, we've been a bit naughty here. Um, we've been a bit um, misdirected. The answer to that question is strictly speaking non, none of the above. Um, but we put we put this question because what, what the answers to this poll reveal is the importance of properly drafted contracts, and in particular, the importance of having both an extension of time clause and a liquidated damages clause. You will have noted that both were missing from the very simple contract that I read out to begin with. Um, just to pick up on the reference to prolongation costs. That's, uh, again, a bit naughty. It's a slight red herring. Time doesn't equal money in engineering construction claims. So just because the works were delayed by six months doesn't mean that the contractor has an entitlement to the financial compensation in relation to that. Time and money claims are separate, and it, it should always be remembered that they must be proven separately. 
even though they might result from the single event. In this case, it's my prevention of John's workforce from accessing the site. So <clears throat> first key principle is achieving an extension of time, if you do so, doesn't mean that the money automatically follows. So John, I'm gonna hand over to you. What, what do you think the practical implications are of missing those provisions? And, and would you sign the contract that I proposed? Well, I wouldn't contract to build a power plant for you anyway, but anyway, um, uh, especially in your back garden. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, I wouldn't sign that contract. I think the important thing is that um, the time associated with, with work performance is actually a major risk issue, and it's a major risk issue for both parties. Um, looking at it from the contractor's point of view, um, because he, in an EPC contract, he's, he's carrying most of that risk. Um, he needs to be able to plan and execute the works, EPC, Engineering, Procurement, Construction, in the most effective, um, efficient, productive and economic manner, obviously. Um, fundamentally, this is really about the type and number of resources that you're going to deploy to do on the different parts of the work. Um, and how they are deployed and utilized and when, because that will affect time. Uh, and it will also affect you know, the number of resources you're gonna put on the job. Um, so to do that, you need some certainty, um, especially regarding your liabilities, because you've got massive liabilities, we're committing to finishing by a certain date. Um, and while the contract has certainty regarding that date, because it's agreed to do the work by then, um, uh, this alone is insufficient. So you have to ask a number of questions. What happens if the contractor is unable to carry out the work as planned? Uh, and you've cited one example where he can't do that in your, in your example. Next question is what happens if the contractor does not deliver the work by the contract completion date? Um, what is the contractor's risk exposure and liabilities in these circumstances? And how are these situations managed? So without adequate provisions to answer those questions, uh, that must, they must be set out in the contract, of course, the contractor faces a great deal of uncertainty as a consequence that it cannot actually um, assess its liabilities and the risk exposure. And therefore, uh, the contractor's unable to make any realistic uh, allowance for those and plan effective mitigation measures. So you, you're actually, when you enter a contract like that, basically you're flying blind. You've got no idea where you stand. So, uh, Alex, um, perhaps we ought to dig in to the importance of having the extension of time and liquidated damages clauses. And what, what do they mean in legal terms? Yeah, okay. Um, well, the simple example that we gave in the first poll highlights why both of these clauses are very important. Um, I, I'll, ref I'll refresh your memory of the simple contract example that I gave you, which was John agrees to build Alex's power plant in exchange for payment of 100 million pounds. John will complete the works by the 1st of January, 2022. So in legal terms, this, believe it or not, is a contract just about. It's got all the elements, um, offer an acceptance, consideration, and an intention to create a legal relationship but it only provides for three things it specifies what it is that is to be constructed the power plant it states how much is to be paid in exchange for that 100 million pounds and it states when the works must be completed 1st of january 2022 and it's a very basic um basic contract but what it doesn't specify is what happens if for some reason John can't fulfill the obligation to complete the works by the 1st of January 2022. And there could be a myriad of reasons why he's unable to do that. Some of which could be my fault, for example, the prevention example. Some of them could be John's fault. For example, he doesn't have sufficient labour to carry out the works. Or some could be neither of our faults. COVID-19 and a certain pandemic is a good example of this. So the contract that we've looked at says nothing about extensions of time. It doesn't specify that liquidated damages are payable for any delay to the completion date. So the question that gives rise to is, under the terms of our simple contract, what is the effect of my act of prevention? 
I didn't allow the workforce onto the site because I didn't have the access rights. Now this introduces a concept that's called time at large. So if I prevent John from accessing the site for a period of six months in which he is not only um, obliged but also entitled to carry out the works and there's no provision that allows a new completion date to be fixed, i.e. there's no extension of time clause, the time under that contract is said to be at large. And that doesn't mean it's a fugitive on the run, it just is a, a legal term of art that applies to this question. Um, and it, it derives from the principle that I, as the employer or the owner under the contract, cannot on one hand prevent the contractor from doing what he's contractually obliged and entitled to do, and on the other hand, hold him to account over the original completion date in the contract. It's almost like tying both hands behind his back and still expecting him to you know, swim 50 meters or whatever it is. So the effect of this is that, legally speaking, John becomes relieved from having to complete the works by the original completion date, by the 1st of January, 2022, and instead, the law says that John must complete the works within a reasonable time. Now, that's known as the prevention principle. So this will mean that John doesn't have to complete the works by 1st of January 2022. And you can see how those answers that we gave you in slightly misleading poll number one start to fall away. So if we change this slightly, Let's imagine our simple contract said something slightly different. So imagine if it said John agrees to build Alex's power plant in exchange for the payment of 100 million pounds. John will complete the works by the 1st of January 2022. So that's the same as before. But then it says for every month that John is delayed in completing the works, John will pay Alex 50,000 pounds a month or part thereof. So knowing that we misled you first time around, I appreciate you may have some reticence in doing another poll, but let's go for it anyway. Poll number two, for the six month delay, how much will John pay in liquidated damages? Let's see what you think. Is it 300,000 pounds representing six months at 50,000 pounds a month? Is it zero, nothing whatsoever, or is it another amount? Now let's see what you think. Okay, got some results. <clears throat> okay, well, well done to the 39% of you who hedged your bets. That's, uh, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> um, the, the answer to this, we have to go into a few things here. So as we just discussed, um, if I prevent John from starting the works for six months, then time is at large under the terms of the prevention principle, which we just talked about. Because there's no extension of time clause, liquidated damages provision is unenforceable. Again, this is derived from the principle that I can't, on one hand, prevent John from starting the works, and on the other hand, penalise him by deducting liquidated damages for any resultant delay. So in that sense, what this contract is badly lacking is an extension of time clause, because the extension of time clause protects the employer's right to claim liquidated damages for delay it gets around this problem created by the prevention principle. An employer cannot claim liquidated damages where there's no mechanism to extend the completion date, principally for his own acts of prevention. So it's all very well and good for an employer to prevent a contractor and claim liquidated damages, as long as the contractor has the right to an extension of time for the prevention. Uh, this gives rise to all the sorts of contract clauses that we all know and we're all familiar with. But I think first point to note about the, um, the extension of time clause is it's, it's a safety mechanism for making sure that the liquidated damages will work. So when you review your contracts uh, or if you draft contracts, if there is one of these clauses without the other one, that's a red flag because either without the other is not going to work. John, have you got anything to add to that? Yeah, I think that's, um, I think the point is also how these extension of time clauses and the liquidated damages provisions 
interact together because what you're saying is you can't have one without the other mm. so um I, and i think in most major contracts today um there is a situation where the liquidated damages are capped and it might be 10 or 15 percent of the contract price or whatever mechanism is decided but the, both parties know that there is a period of time over which liquidated damages accrue due to delays by the contractor uh, and therefore both parties are able to assess what their you know the contractor is able to assess his liability and the con the owner knows what he's going to gather uh in um, money from the contractor as a result of his breach of contract for not meeting the completion date so that's mm -hmm. fine i think in those contracts where the lds are not capped we have a very different scenario because the liabilities on the part of the contractor are not calculable i mean it could be the entire contract price if the delay is long enough so mm. it's uh, you it, it's a major risk issue that is so therefore contracts without caps on lds should be looked at very very carefully uh, about the real exposure that the contract is letting himself in for in the main so um those that accrual of liquidated damages in most international engineering contracts tends to accrue over about three or four months or six months maximum now if you're looking at, the, at, at a situation with an investment that's going to be uh, driving uh, monetary rewards for the owner then what you want is that plant starting as soon as possible so the accrual of liquidated damages is geared such that it encourages the achievement of the completion days because you may reach a point where the delay is such that it starts to affect the business case so the the, the original uh, um, commitment decisions were made upon and as soon as that happens of course the the, the owner is in a in a very uh, difficult position because because he's got limited um, recovery through the LDs and it's, it's starting to hurt his, his, his remuneration through the investment. So some um, owners uh, link termination with accrual of maximum liquidated damages, which in that sense seems sensible. Why should I continue with this project if this contractor can't deliver? However, it's fraught with danger and there's two things to consider there first is unless unless those conditions about termination linked to maximum lds are crafted very carefully they're more trouble than they're worth and secondly um the termination of a contractor depending on when termination accrues but i would suggest it's nearer the end rather than the beginning of a project yeah. it's not necessarily going to improve the delay situation <laughs> because it's going to take the best part of a year to put a new contractor in place mm. so and and it's it's you know it, it, it it's in theory it sounds fine in practice it's a bit like you were talking about in one of the other seminars before the owner has the power but it's of no use to him mm. and the other thing that i've noticed and i've got some experience in is that those provisions tend to encourage abuse and uh, a couple of years ago i was um engaged on a power plant job as project management expert uh, in an arbitration and basically the the main part of the arbitration was about the owner having terminated the contractor at 95 percent complete now when i got briefed on that i thought there's something a bit odd here um why is this happening nobody in the right mind would terminate at 95 percent complete uh the contractor because no how bad no matter how bad they've been you, that last five percent you must be able to manage so there was something else that was driving it i'm not going to go into that here what is interesting when i did the investigation is the there were three heads of claim that the contractor had submitted extensions of time for one was for a redesign of the turbine hall during detailed engineering because the owner had managed to get the thing the wrong size uh, in, his, in his design brief. Um, the second thing was um, the land over which the 60 inch diameter cooling water pipes, uh, two twin pipes, and it was about um, two, two kilometers, 
and you know you can't commission a power plant without cooling water so it was fairly important uh it didn't give them access for about a year and a half uh when they needed it and the third thing was it was a force majeure event uh where there was some flooding and they were delayed in the delivery of the gas turbines so fairly then there was a lot of small bits and pieces as you might imagine um so we looked at that and in a short story uh, we presented this to the tribunal and the tribunal said well um, basically the, you terminated and we can't we can't alter that fact but because there were these extension of time uh, provisions that had to be adjudicated upon and all you did uh, Mr Owner was reject them in one line letters without taking uh, any care to understand what it was about now we look at it we find there was an extension of time due Therefore, the maximum liquidated damages were not um, achieved, uh, weren't accrued, uh, and therefore you had no basis for terminating contractually for cause. Therefore, you terminate it for uh, convenience, and here's the bill, and they awarded substantial damages to the contractor, and we're talking about hundreds of millions. Um, so I think that example is 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 you know is what's happening in industry and the, the, these things you've got to be able to manage the extensions of time and the liquidated damages together and deal with them appropriately otherwise you one way or another you get a mess <clears throat> so um, Alex um, in engineering construction contracts, liquidated damages are sums agreed to be payable for breach of the contractor's obligations to complete the works. Sorry, legal terms, Alex. Yeah, legal terms, liquidated damages. I'll just have a little um, side stop there to talk about termination, because I think your, your example was really good, John, and it, it touched on a whole host of issues. Uh, termination is is much thrown around but should always be exercised with extreme caution um, and the, re the reason for that is that if you get termination wrong you can find yourself in a very bad position legally um, which is <laughs> maybe putting it lightly but you yourself could be exposed to the argument that you have repudiated the contract which is to say you intend not to be bound by it anymore and if the other side accepts that repudiation then that exposes the party that made the incorrect termination to potentially vast damages because they're they're uncapped essentially so yes be very careful with termination and um, always take particular advice if that's something that needs to happen going back to liquidated damages um so in engineering construction terms liquidated damages are sums that parties agree will be payable for a breach of contract and the breach of contract is the breach of the contractor's obligation to complete the works by the specified completion date. Um, it is, of course, common that you also have performance based liquidated damages, particularly in EPC contracts. But the principle is the same. They are sums that are agreed to be paid in the event of a breach of contract. So in terms of delay, <clears throat> it's pretty common. And most most engineering contracts have these and most construction contracts have them as well. Uh, and agreeing the liquidated damages effectively avoids the party suffering the breach of contract from having to prove its claim for damages resulting from breach of contract. If we go back to first principles, if a contract is breached, a party is entitled to claim damages. And it's entitled to claim the damages that result from the breach of contract, whether those are direct or whether those are more indirect losses. And the, the law establishes what those things are and the often contractual limitations or, or caps will apply as well. So the liquidated damages clause is quite handy because it prevents those damages from having to be proven. If you do have to prove damages, they're known as general damages. And proving general damages for a breach of contract that leads to delay is I'm taking the words from Keating on construction contracts, which some of you might be familiar with, Difficult, complex, and expensive. <laughs> Doesn't sound good. Um, so this is why parties agree liquidated damages to avoid that difficult, complex, and expensive act of having to prove all the losses that might result from a delay. So clauses in contracts that deal with liquidated damages will usually specify that 
a certain sum of money is to be deducted at a particular rate over a particular period of time, whether it's per day, per month, or whatever. From the period where the works remain incomplete until they are finally completed. And as John said, it's good that they become subject to an overall cap, because if they're not, then this can give rise to a whole host of other issues. So where you have liquidated damages which are agreed, legally speaking, there can be no inquiry into the actual loss that has been suffered. And sometimes parties uh, get confused by this, both sides, contractors and employers. They sort of forget that these are the damages that they agreed would be payable in the event of that particular breach. And employers will say, well, I underestimated the liquidity damages. My actual losses are much higher. And contractors will be unhappy because they have to pay them. But actually, my view is that the liquidated damages benefit both parties. They benefit the employer because he doesn't have to prove his losses. He doesn't have to do the difficult, complex and expensive exercise that Keating talks about. And it benefits the contractor because effectively liquidated damages are themselves a cap on liability for delay related losses. So the contractor knows its financial exposure if it causes delay to the completion date. And if there's an overall cap on the liquidated damages, it has even more certainty. And I think it's it's probably fair to say that liquidated damages, generally speaking, are probably underestimates by employers. So they're likely to be lower than the employer's actual losses because the employer always has to formulate some kind of calculation to establish them. So what they should be is a pre-agreed estimate of future losses. So for employers, that involves having a calculation to be made. And in a, in a simple example, if it's the construction of a shop, it's the potential for lost revenue if the shop doesn't open on time based on a number of weeks of trading. And you scale that up depending on the project. Um, so I think there is a substantial to risk to the employer. If, if they overestimate the liquidated damages, then they may get a windfall um, subject to penalties, which we'll come on to. But I think that's less likely than the more common position, which is where employers complain that liquidated damages have been underestimated when they consider their actual losses, which of course at the time after the delay has happened, they know what they are. And they are essentially because of the liquidated damages clause fixed with the lower amount. So depending on the terms of the contract, um, creative employers might try to claim general damages instead, because if you can prove all those losses, you can do away with the liquidated damages. Although I think there's a, there's an open question about whether a court would allow that. And I think, although it's not ever been tested in courts, um, commentators suggest that if that was to happen, then the courts would probably cap the general damages to the level of liquidated damages. And you can see the logic for that. It's on, you know, you can't agree one thing and then try to have, have your own way via another method. It's a sort of cake and eat it position. Um, John, have you got any practical experience with the operation of the liquidated damages clause? Yeah, I mean, the first point I'd like to make, Alex, is that what you've just been talking about has been between employer and contractor. Yeah. But those principles apply, whether it's between employer and contractor, contractor and subcontractors, contractor and vendors. That we're talking about principles here in any contracting arrangement about LDs for delays and extension of time clauses. So I think we need to just think about that in the, in in that overall sense. Um, so I think that for various reasons there is often misunderstanding and even abuse of the LD provisions in different scenarios. And I think you can capture those under under three headings, the, and we call it the employer now, but it could be the, the contractor or whatever, depending on the contractual relationship. They use the, the LDs as a stick to beat the contractor to achieve. So it's a sort of threat that's always hanging there. Mm -hmm. uh, and they do enjoy it. Um, <laughs> uh, as a means, and, they use, and, and, and the second point is, they use it as a means to set off against contractors other, otherwise genuine changes, claims, etc. in some sort of uh, divvying up at the end of the project. Yeah. And yeah. there are some even scrupulous organisations or unscrupulous organisations, should I say, 
that they see the LDs as a cash discount because they've got control of the time, the type of grant time, and the contract is late, and they've got a provision in the contract that you've just described that says they're entitled to take it and they don't have to prove anything. Mm, so why yes. not? Complete abuse. Um, and that that approach, uh, I would suggest, gets people into a serious amount of difficulties in mm. the event that it's cont contested legally. So um, I think this this sort of approach, this sort of thinking of using the liquidated damages as some sort of commercial leverage um, leads to the situation where owners prefer not to grant extensions of time uh, mm. when they're properly due, but prefer to leave it to the end of the job. And then we'll do a balancing uh, and we'll see uh, what actually happens. Um, now, if you look at the Arcadis report for 2019, published this year, uh, a couple of months ago, the second most common reason in that period for disputes was the failure to grant extensions of time when they were properly due. So people are taking this seriously now. The extensions of time and the, the uh, Society of Construction Law Protocol basically says, do it as, as close to the delay event as possible. Yeah. And there's a reason for that, because you're refixing the date against which the contractor can plan his works. If you don't do it, he hasn't got a date. And mm -hmm. that means that he's starting to lose control and he can't plan the works. So the whole purpose of the extension of time provision disappears because it's not being used properly and as it was intended. And I see that happening time after time. Yeah. So, if we're looking at liquidated damages, then what are our main defenses? What are the main defenses to liquidated damages? Yeah. Um... So the, the defences, I think, can be categorised into three main headings, and there are others, but the principal defences are um, establishing that the liquidated damages sum is a penalty, um, the employer caused the delay, or you have an extension of time. And most commonly, the defence to liquidated damages is that there should have been an extension of time. Uh, as you were touching on there, John, and I, I do agree. I think the more real time these things are, um, as you go through the project, and you know, forms of contract are even encouraging this now. The NEC has been with us for a long time, and it it is all about doing things as they happen. But FIDIC, the new 2017 suite, is also encouraging these kind of yeah, practices, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's very sensible because it's far easier to deal with um, claims and issues as they arise than it is you know, throwing them into the mountain and dealing with the mountain at the end of the job, as more commonly happens, unfortunately. So in terms of um, penalties, the agreed sum is a penalty. Now, liquidated damages in some jurisdictions um, are referred to as penalty clauses without any controversy whatsoever. Um, but under English law, liquidated damages that amount to a penalty are unenforceable. And this was clarified by the Supreme Court in this country in the, the case known as Cavendish Square in 2015, which was a, a case where two of different appeal decisions were fused together and the court considered them. One, one side of it related to a corporate transaction in which there was an alleged penalty and the other side of it related to parking charges in a car park that were said to be penalties. So it should be said that none of this relates to engineering construction contracts, but it was nonetheless um, the law on penalties, and it, it is applicable to engineering construction contracts in terms of liquidated damages. And the, the key point that came out of this case was that the court said the test of whether liquidated damages amount to a penalty is basically to do with proportionality. So the court said that the test was whether the liquidated damages, and this is a quote, imposed a detriment on the contract breaker out of all proportion to any legitimate interest of the other party. Now, those are pretty woolly words, and you know it's hard to say what precisely is meant by them, but it, it seems to me it's all about a question of fact and circumstance in any particular given case. So if, you, you know, if you're seeking to apply liquidated damages of um, a million pounds a day 
onto a development that was let's say a contract sum of ten thousand pounds you, you can kind of see where the court is heading because that seems to be out of all proportion with the value of the contract to begin with um, but it is worth remembering that this was not a case dealing with construction and engineering contracts and liquidated damages it was as i say a corporate transaction and and, and parking <laughs> um, so the relevant question i think in terms of engineering construction contracts that has to be considered in terms of penalties is whether the sum that has been expressed as the liquidated damages is extravagant, uh, is it exorbitant, or is it even unconscionable? Is it so high that it's just ridiculous? That's, I think, the, that's probably how I would have expressed it um, if it was down to me, but that's, I think, where the court was heading. Um, so if the sum is a penalty, then it won't be enforced by the English courts, and hence why it's a defence. So. I think the, the guidance on this in terms of drafting contracts and when you assess liquidated damages and liquidated damages calculations are that they do still have to be a genuine pre-estimate of the loss. You know, they, they can't be a complete work of fiction. And um, it, it's always prudent and when I advise clients on drafting contracts to have some kind of calculation done and documented and put on a piece of paper because that, that could always be quite useful later on that actually explains how it is that they've calculated the liquidated damages. And it has to be by reference to things like the loss of revenue if the plant isn't started on time, those kind of things. Um, the, the second main defence that, that the employer caused the delay, well, this goes back to our, our example that we started off with. If the employer prevents the contractor from carrying out the works, thereby delaying the completion date of those works, then there is a contractual right to an extension of time, or at least there should be. If there isn't, you have the prevention principle kicking in, time is at large, and the contractor is relieved from the obligation to complete and must do so by a reasonable time. But in terms of the defence, if the employer caused the delay, um, a party cannot benefit from its own breach of contract. So the employer loses the right to claim liquidated damages. And the final, the heading, the final heading was extension of time, which we've sort of touched on already. If there is a valid extension of time in respect of the delay, then that has the effect of fixing a new completion date and it relieves the party from liquidated damages. Um, that's obviously subject to any further extensions of time that may follow. But it again re-emphasizes that the extension of time clause is very important because it preserves the owner's right to levy those liquidated damages. So John, in, in practical terms, what's your experience on how contractors should manage their delays to to get the extensions of time and to avoid the LDs. Before I go on to that, can I ask a question? Yeah. In many contracts today, we see multiple completion dates and LDs against them. Yeah. What's the implications of that from a legal point of view and the uh, assessment of the LD amount has been a uh, genuine pre-estimate of the damage so I, think it, yeah, yeah. I think in terms of the, you know having multiple dates for completion you know whether you express those as sections or um you know phases or whatever they happen to be effectively what you're saying is you're taking over the works a step at a time and so legally and contractually you can apply liquidated damages to a number of completion dates if if the works are being completed in that manner uh, I think it makes it very confusing. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of a case that has sort of enshrined any principles where you have these multiple completion dates and different sets of liquidated damages. But in theory, what should happen is every time you complete a section, the liquidated damages for everything else reduce accordingly. So the theory of it, I think, is quite good, but I, I can understand in practice, it all can become a bit of a mess, um, to say the very least. So. Yeah, I'm not sure there's any extra guidance in, in that sense. The principles are basically the same, but they are um, split into however many phases or sections of work you have. And then there's the question of, I suppose, whatever's left at the end and whether there's a, you know, a balance of liquidated damages. But I, I think I would suggest to parties, be careful about how you structure these things, both in terms of the, the, the sections of work themselves, but also um, the liquidated damages that apply. I, I do remember one contract where a party tried to say that uh, section one of the works was arriving on site. <laughs> section 
section two of the works was demolition <laughs> you know and so they not only are they getting liquidated damages issues but the the attempt behind that was of course to get substantial stage payments for having done not very much at all yeah yeah and it does make the assessment of extensions of time uh an absolute nightmare Absolutely. Uh, in, in in being able to show uh, um impact from one uh, milestone to the next uh yeah. and you know so i think going back to your question i think the managing um delays extensions of time and the corresponding lds i think it falls into three categories because you and 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 each category requires a different approach so first of all we have events for which the contractor is responsible for. You, you you've talked about that we have events for which the owner is responsible we've talked about that and we also have force majeure or similar type causes um which um you know frequently occur on on projects and they're usually a separate provision in the contract uh for dealing with the with the time adjustment uh, and i mean subject to the terms of the contract um the, the contract is going to be entitled to extensions of time for the the last two and obviously not the first you won't get extension of time for his own delays um um and obviously subject to in, in mitigating as may be required by the contract, the effect of those uh, delays for which the owner uh, bears responsibility. So um, where you've got contractor delays from a management point of view, then unless the contract says the owner shall receive from the contractor details of all delays to the progress of the works, regardless of who is responsible, then basically those delays for the caused by the contractor he has to deal with it and manage it and it's really got nothing to do with the owner other than where the owner says uh, you're behind um, catch up and get back on schedule um, you can have that sort of intervention but basically how to deal with it what to do is entirely in the control of the contractor and his, his main obligation of course is to is to reduce that delay and get back on plan wherever he can um, where we have events for which the owner is responsible then that will require a different course of action altogether because the contract will specify things like notices provision of details demonstration of entitlement to extension of time etc etc um, and that might include you know we've got delay um impact on change orders which may be quite different to the delay impact of owners exercises of rights such as suspension for the sake of sake of argument because that will have its own regulations in the contract um and then we may just have owners breaches of contract uh, which again may have a, a completely different mechanism in the contract for dealing with them so we have to be very clear about what we're dealing with in terms of a delay and who is responsible for it right from the outset then of course we have force majeure which is everybody's favorite um because it uh, <coughs> assigns no a responsibility huh, we see about that but basically um force majeure will require a whole has usually a whole set of uh, conditions how you manage it how you notify it, what happens during its duration, how long it may run, what happens at the end of it, etc. So mm. we've got three packages of situations where we may have delays, some of which for which entitlement to extension of time might exist as long as it's proven. And the way that those are managed um, is, is determined by the contract. Yeah. So um, again, um the arcadis report for 2019 said the the main reason for disputes was badly prepared claims and i believe that those badly prepared claims result from a failure to look at the causes of delay uh, and how they're managed under the contract and not managing them in accordance with the contract and that's where that's the sort of root of all evil as you might say um and it's 
it, it, it doesn't help if you if usually if you get into some sort of dispute you're going to employ delay analysts etc the delay analyst can only really do his job well when you've done your job well in managing the events and documenting them and dealing with them on time etc etc anything yeah. else leads to wishy-washy compromises over the facts mm. which doesn't help the lawyers in arguing the case or even uh, the people who are trying to negotiate a resolution because it, it's just unclear so the need to get a grip is really paramount um alex a subject that i'm sure everybody's waiting for you to talk about is concurrent delay <laughs> thank you for that john yes <laughs> Why don't we talk about concurrent delay? Um, yes, uh, an issue that vexes many, um, let's say. Uh, breaking it down, I'll go through this as um, humanely as possible. Uh, <laughs> concurrent delay is a strategic defense, let's call it that to begin with, um, that, that a party may use where you have uh, an employer's risk event, let's say uh, prevention, um, and a contractor's risk event, let's say a shortage of workforce, uh, that both cause delay to a project at the same time. Now, this at the same time business is what really causes the problem with concurrent delay, because the, there's a school of thought that it means exactly at the same time. There's a school of thought that suggests it's when things overlap. And what it always, to me personally, seems to ignore is the fact that there's not just one event on one side and one event on the other. In, a, in any construction project, there will be a whole host of events that are happening all at once, all the time, simultaneously, uh, overlapping, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think while this creates a lot of fun for delay analysis, uh, analysis in particular, um, I think the courts and lawyers have really struggled to get to grips with what this is all about. And I think that reflects the fact that it's complex. So the effect of that scenario, where you have a, a, a concurrent delay between an employer's risk event and a contractor's risk event, what will the contractor argue? The contractor will argue that it's entitled to an extension of time. Um, there may also be a claim for money, but we put that on one side for now. Um, and the reason for that is that an employer's risk event occurred. Now, on the other side of the fence, the employer says it's entitled to liquidated damages in respect of the contractor's risk event because the contractor caused the delay. Therefore, liquidated damages apply. And obviously, this, uh, this again, only works if the delay is critical. Um, the court's approach to the subject of concurrent delay, I'm going to be charitable and I will say it has been in a manner which reflects the complexity of the issue. Um, <laughs> The, uh, the consensus among commentators um, seems to be that the events must be simultaneous for the delay to be classed as concurrent. And the English courts confirm that in the case of Adyard, Abu Dhabi and um, SD Marine Services. And there's, there's a lineage of um, case decisions on concurrent delay, particularly over the last sort of 15, 20 years that have um, espoused and discussed the theories, but they haven't, I don't think they've really come up with the answer just yet. Um, so the first port of call in any concurrent delay issue is to look at the terms of the contract and whether the contract says anything about concurrent delay whatsoever. Most don't. Um, so I think the starting point is that if the contract says something about concurrent delay, you at least have some clarity. Um, but most standard forms don't address it at all and, and many bespoke contracts don't either. Uh, the, the 2017 FIDIC contract suite is something of an exception in that they do at least address concurrent delay, but um, they leave it to the parties to decide the rules on what will happen. Um, so it sort of pays lip service to you know, the fact that it addresses it, but it doesn't really deal with it. So you, I think you're still in the same situation, which is the parties have to decide what's going to happen. Um, so they leave it leave it to them, um, which isn't particularly helpful. And I think the, the, the people it's least helpful for are for those who administer contracts, because I can see how this is something of a nightmare. Um, FIDIC's point of view is that because there's no standard approach towards concurrent delay, then different rules and procedures can apply in different jurisdictions. And I, I think I have a degree of sympathy with that. Um, 
but I think having no defined position on how current concurrent delays are to be treated can simply lead to disputes because you have arguments that can go in both directions. I think the first point under English law is to say that parties are free to specify how concurrent delays will be treated. That's good. Um, but if the contract says nothing, then English law has developed a position and it, it's a general position that in effect, the contractor receives the benefit of the concurrent delay. So where you have the employer risk event and the contractor risk event, both causing delay at the same time, and the contract doesn't say otherwise, then the contractor is entitled to the extension of time. Now, I think from a time point of view, that's fairly clear. And I think from a money point of view, this is where it really causes a problem, because as we said, time doesn't equal money and it doesn't equal money here. It's the same principle. So I think I think a contractor that gets the extension of time may struggle to satisfy the test for causation in terms of the money, because the test for causation in terms of the money is known as the but for test. So but for the employee's breach of contract, let's say, then the contractor wouldn't have incurred the loss. So I think the principles run slightly divergently in that the law says, yes, contractor gets extension of time, but it doesn't say anything about the money. So again, it's important to know that money and time are not the same and the claims and what's required to prove the claims are different. Um, time and money ent entitlements are separate. So this is why I think parties will sometimes try to reverse the position in terms of extensions of time in the contract drafting, because then it is clear and it takes away the sort of strategic defense that the contractor might otherwise have. Um, I've seen some very complex clauses dealing with concurrent delay over the years, and they are a real headache. Uh, I, I recall one contract in particular that tried to deal with an employer delay concurrent with a contractor delay, a contra contractor delay concurrent with another delay, and then uh, what, the, what was referred to as a tripartite concurrent delay, which is when somebody else had a delay that was concurrent with either of those things. And um, it's, it's safe to say it was pretty uh, head scratching. But I think there is, again, some comfort from the courts uh, because they've they've held the fact that fairly simple clauses can work. So um, there's a case which involved North, Mid North Midland Building Limited and Sidon Homes, um, which was where the courts considered um, a concurrent delay clause, which was fairly simple, that stated where the employer risk event and the contractor risk event both occur at the same time, the contractor is not entitled to the extension of time. And the court held that a clause as simple as that was effective um, and also that it didn't offend the prevention principle, which is another point. But I think all that shows is that it's quite simple to just reverse the position at law in contract drafting, and that's OK. Um, so whereas the contractor generally gets the benefit if the contract says nothing, the employer can get the benefit if the contract says something. And it seems that all the contract has to say is to reverse the position, as was the case in um, in the North Midland building. But I think overall, my suspicion is that concurrent delay isn't an issue that comes up very often. And it's more of a legal fabrication or a legal construct, perhaps, than uh, a genuine issue. Because, as I said, I think you always have uh, crossover in terms of activities happening on a construction site at any one time. and true concurrency is exceptionally rare and I think when the you know when the delay analysis is done you are generally looking for events that go one way or another and in my experience concurrent delay doesn't tend to come up very much I think it's more of a um, a sort of intellectual exercise in some ways that um, has been under consideration in some cases because parties have raised that particular defense don't know if you want to throw anything in there, John, as you kindly gave me that question right at the end. Um, no, it's good. Uh, I, th I think that I see more often now um, people who are defending extension of time claims where they they argue on the basis of concurrency where the contract says that that no extension of time will be granted due to concurrency, that everything is concurrent. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is the difficulty that, that I think that contractors or subcontractors have 
in establishing the entitlement because any it seems to me that people classify any event for which the contractor is responsible concurrent delay with anything that the owner is responsible for or force majeure which just adds mm -hmm. a, a further complexity to the whole issue yeah whereas as you've just explained concurrency is all about two events occurring on parallel or the same critical path more or less at the same time and for that to happen genuinely on a project is rare mm. they may be sequential but they're not concurrent yeah and that's a different argument altogether so it it has been created into something of a myth in my view mm. but it suits the owners to play with the myth to defeat the contractor and of course their advisors at contract drafting time do enjoy writing in these concurrent provisions of some length um, <laughs> which simply confuse and confound the situation and don't help it at all mm. but it's life and that's what we get you know we have to deal with um, so I think it's it's a difficult difficult situation uh, and but you know, advice to contractors and subcontractors is don't sign a contract with somebody saying concurrency applies mm. um, because um, you're on the way to having something of a bit of a disagreement with the other party at some stage. Yeah, and, and you're effectively signing away the right that you have in the law, yeah. which is, you know, the extension of time is to your benefit. And, and that to me has always felt like the right thing. Um, you know, I've advised owners and I've advised contractors, but I think if an event arises, which is an extension of time, then it should be an extension of time. And I think that's that's the way that the court has treated it. Um, as you say, it's never, never really that simple. Dare I mention it, though? Um, there is the question of emotion that creeps in here. <laughs> Uh, but nobody wanting to actually admit and act, explain why a job isn't finishing on time. And yeah. the easiest way for one party is to blame the other for it yeah. uh, instead of dealing with the issues. So we, we do have this, this whole behavioral issue around time management, and um, which ultimately has the great potential of driving disputes instead of, as practical people, getting hold of the situation and dealing with it at the time. Um, and the, there are the mechanisms there to do it but we seem to be a bit re um, reluctant to get a grip um, yeah. and, and, and deal with the issues. If you do, it works, in my experience, it works quite well. Um, and you, you, can, you can solve these issues. Leave them, and unlike red wine, they don't improve. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that's absolutely right. And, and sort of on this theme, we, we have had a question come in, which I'll just read out quickly as we have a couple of minutes. Um, it says, if the customer doesn't grant extensions of time when it is due, what remedies and provisions do contractors have to deal with these situations? And I think the basic answer to that is it depends on what the contract says, but the, the sort of slightly um, mischievous answer to that question is the arbitration clause <laughs> or the dispute resolution provisions. Um, because I think if, if entitlements that are otherwise valid are not being granted, and I think unfortunately that's probably where you end up, a lot of time and as you said John I think it's it should be the way that these things are resolved as you go but they do tend to get piled up at the end and it then becomes a sort of question of picking through everything to see if the entitlement was valid in the first place and, and what defenses there are to it. Yeah and I think if the contract says the owner or the, or the contractor shall grant an extension of time if these criteria are satisfied then the real acid test is the claimant satisfying the criteria and if he's done that and established that a, an extension of time is genuinely due mm. then the owner's in breach of contract yeah uh and it, it's dead simple so it, again it comes back to the management of the issues and dealing with them in accordance with the regulations that are set out in the contract it's what we put them there for yeah. And yet we tend to ignore them until, you know, they're beyond any use. <laughs> That's right. 
that's right well, unfortunately i think on that uh on that pearl of wisdom we're going to have to leave it for today we've almost come to the end of our time um if this webinar made you think of any questions or issues that you're facing on your projects then talk to us about that get in touch with me or john um the next in this series will be on the 27th of august that's about a month from now on the topic of preparing for delay analysis delay is a five letter word that is time consuming and expensive to explain we think um so we will be exploring how to cut the cost of schedule delay analysis by effective preparation uh thank you for joining us today have thank a good you. afternoon we hope to see best. you thank you bye